Sorry? I didn't hear that. Okay, cool. Um, hi, it doesn't look like there's anybody here yet, but that's kind of okay. Let me just adjust the light, get a bit more light on the subject being me. Um, hi, and welcome to the live chat for the winter solstice. I'm going to be talking about movies. I'm going to be talking about what I've been watching and what I've purchased and also about some movie books. So it's all going to be fun as soon as somebody turns up. Let's see how we go. Uh, I'll waffle a little bit because there will be people who will watch this after the live stream. Um, yeah, it's been winter here, which kind of sucks a little bit more than it should. And why do I wear black tops when white things get on there? Um, um, let's see. Bye for the Hobbit. Yeah, hi. I'm glad you love the channel. The Richies, ha, I only just realized it was live. Um, yeah, it's live. I'm doing a live one because I felt like it. I've been planning to do it for a few weeks now actually about a month or so, and I haven't done a live chat for a while. And, uh, yeah, so I thought I'd give it a go, so cheers. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff um, I've been watching and uh, that I've kind of acquired lately. I've got a deal with Umbrella Entertainment where they're sending me a whole bunch of stuff that I don't have to pay for, and I'm going to be reviewing that, and there's some really interesting bits of 1980s cinema, horror cinema in particular, and things like that, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, hi, Lee. How you doing? Um, yeah, so let me put the headphones on properly and we'll get started. Uh, yeah, so what have I been watching? Now, I'm going to look at, I've got a um, bunch of stuff here. Justin, welcome aboard. Uh, yeah, so there's some things I've purchased and I've actually got the microphone boom in exactly the wrong position to show you these things. Yeah, by for Umbrella is a great um, creator. Uh, there's two really, really good ones here in Australia. Umbrella is definitely one of them, and Impulse, uh, Imprint is the other one. Imprint is just so fantastically good. But this one's from the Beyond Genres sub-label of Umbrella Entertainment. Picked it up yesterday because uh, JB Hi-Fi, which is our big store that sells DVDs and Blu-rays here, uh, had a 20% off sale, and I can never resist that. And uh, this one's a Stuart Gordon movie from, I think, when is it from? Um, about 2000, I think. Let me have a look here closer. 2001. It's a little movie called Dagon. Now, if you haven't seen Dagon, you really should watch it. It's one of the best Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, adaptations ever. A lot of practical um, special effects with a little bit of computer-generated stuff. But it's uh, based on the uh, Shadow of Inner's Mouth. And it's a really good, solid Lovecraftian adaptation. Um, Peter Cushion, where do I get the music I use in my videos? Um, there's a thing called Epidemic Sound. You, you pay a subscription every year, which is a little expensive in Australian dollars. But I like the range of music that they've got. And I can kind of tune the music to the kind of video I'm doing. And... Uh, that's, yeah, as I said, it's a little bit expensive in Australian dollars, but I think the value is there. But anyway, if you haven't seen Dagon, you really should see that. Really fantastic movie. There's a lot of extras on this one as well. We've got um, interviews with some of the stars and Stuart Gordon, the producer and director. Um, interviews on the set with Stuart Gordon and uh, Paco Rabal, who's one of the actors in it. And Umbrella is just kind of coming left field and putting some really great um, releases together, uh, bringing them into higher definition, of course, being Blu-ray. And that was one of the ones I got. Let's have a look. Uh, Lee, yeah, absolutely. Dagon is cheesy, but it's great, and it's also incredibly creepy. The the people they get to play the denizens of the, of the town that the protagonist gets into, or the protagonists get into, is um, pretty creepy. I think it was made in Spain, and it, it really does have that otherworldly feel about it. Let's have a look. So uh, this one, I actually started watching one of these last night. Haven't finished it yet. It's a rewatch. But Umbrella's also putting out a retro horror double feature, which is really useful. And this one has got one that turns up on a lot of uh, kind of box sets of movies from the 1930s. And it's got 
the Island of Lost Souls and the Black Cat. Now, the Island of Lost Souls, of course, with Charles Lawton and Richard Arlen and Bela Lugosi, that adaptation of uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau, the H.G. Wells story, which um, the adaptation was actually done by Philip Wiley, which is interesting because he made a bunch of interesting things, including the book upon which When Wilkes Collide was based on. The Black Cat's got a beautiful style to it, but I'm not as in love with it as I am with uh, The Island of Lost Souls. Uh, the Island of Lost Souls has got such a wonderful production design, even though um, one of the things that annoys me is throughout the movie, the protagonists are talking about Apia, one of the places in one of the Pacific Islands, and they keep calling it Apia. So that annoys me a lot. Um, I actually checked out the latitude and longitude where apparently Dr. Moreau's Island is supposed to be. And it's about 100 kilometers east of American Samoa, which uh, is kind of cool. So now I know where the Island of the Beastmen is. But uh, Island of Lost Souls, you really should check out. It's pre-code, so it's got some very edgy looking stuff in it. The makeup effects for the 1930s are terrifically good. I'm amazed at how good those makeup effects are. And uh, it's worth getting in if you can. Uh, I've got the Black Cat on a couple of different uh, box sets. So uh, getting that one wasn't particularly important, but I really wanted to get a good quality legal copy of Island of Lost Souls. And I definitely have. Uh, has the stream stopped? Somebody shout out on the live on the chat because it's not moving at the moment, and I'm worried. Excuse me, just have another drink. There we go. Yeah, but it's all good. So, yeah, that gets flowing. I just wanted to make sure. So I'm going to finish The Island of Lost Souls a little bit later. Uh, the other thing I've done is that I've finally got my 4K set up working properly. I finally figured out that I needed to have two HDMI cables hooked into the TV, one for the sound and one for the visuals. And so I've been watching things on the 4K Blu-ray player now, and it's a game changer. Not a fascist slave. Hi, Terry. He said, welcome to Fantasy Island, and I said, the plane, the plane. Yep. Hang on. <coughs> I knew I was going to cough because I've got a sinus condition where my sinuses drip which is why the uh, editing is sometimes choppy on the videos. But I'm going to try to drink that out with the Starbucks I've got here. But yeah, I, The Island of Lost Souls, I think it's there's two remakes of it, and neither of them is particularly good. But the original one builds a mood. I mean, it's not perfect because we are very much more attuned to imperfections in movies than people were, say, in the 1930s. But uh, you should check it out if you haven't seen it already. Now, as everybody knows, I, I watched a lot of movies in the 1970s. I went to a lot of cinemas. Movies and cinemas were my sanctuaries during the, my, a very rough period in my life. And I saw this one, and Ken Lorba put it out on Blu-ray. And I acquired it. Uh, it's really interesting with Ken Lorba releases if you're here in Australia. If you buy them directly from Kino Lorber, they're going to cost you a mortgage. But if you buy them on eBay, you can get them cheaper than you can getting them from the original production company. And this one I picked up. Uh, uh, Jägermeister is good for sinuses. The original opiated Jägermeister is good for sinuses or whatever else bothers you. Usually. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here, mate. I'm not going to start getting on the piss yet. Uh, anyway, going back to what I was talking about, uh, this one directed by Robert Klaus, who directed Enter the Dragon, continues a little bit. It's got a, a soundtrack by Lalo Schifrin, uh, same as Enter the Dragon. But this one's a bit different. Joe Don Baker and Jim Kelly in Golden Needles, which is a crazy 1970s action film. Joe Don Baker can't do kung fu, but he does kind of barrel his way through and punch things really well. It's got a great supporting cast too. Jim Baker, uh, Jim Kelly, sorry. Jim Kelly isn't in it very much. But the supporting cast, Elizabeth Ashley, is a really good playing the love interest. She gets to say some really weird things in this movie, but she gives good value in it. Um, and she used to be married to George Papad as well, come to think of it. 
But uh, there's also Burgess Meredith playing one of the main bad guys, and he gets to act it up and camp it up wonderfully. He pivots from being kind of cheerful and avuncular and, and cheeky kind of impish bad guy to dead set stone killer bad guy on on in a second. It it's really is an interesting role for him. You also got people like Anne Southern in it. Um, yeah, this one was made, was it made by Warner Brothers? Uh, no, Orion Pictures. So it's not a War, Warner Brothers beat, but Golden Needles, if you get a chance to see this one, this one is crazy 1970s action, which um, borrows a little bit from Into the Dragon. There's the original cover art as I saw it on VHS back in the day. And uh, yeah, it's it's really a kind of hidden gem of 1970s action cinema. And you should definitely check that one out. A beautiful transfer. There's a, there's a bunch of extras. There's an audio commentary by a couple of film historians, Howard S. Berger and Chris uh, Pagayali. Um, and there's newly commissioned art. There's radio spots, image gallery, and a trailer. Uh, yeah, this, this is like one of those perfect drive-in movies. And Joe Don Baker in it. Uh, it's really interesting having him playing the protagonist rather than the antagonist. And Charlie Varity made a really interesting um, antagonist to Walter Matthau's lead character. But in this one, he gets to play the hero, and, and it's kind of fun and kind of weird to see him doing that. So, uh, yeah, and I like it. Let me put this aside. Put Dagon and the other one aside because I don't want to get things mixed up. Stop for a sip. Cheers. The next one I got is directed by Sidney Pollock. It's a movie from 1969. This one is a war movie, but it's more than a war movie. It really does have a, a kind of supernatural aspect to it, which I find really interesting. It's about a bunch of American soldiers in World War II who end up um, occupying a French castle. And it's a thing called Castle Keep with Bert Lancaster in it, Jean-Pierre Ormont, Patrick O'Neill, Scott Wilson, Tony Bill, Al Freeman Jr., James Patterson, Bruce Dern, and Peter Falk. It's got music by Michelle Legrand and directed by Sidney Pollock. Now, if you haven't seen this one, you should definitely check this out because it really is a hidden gem of that 19... 60 cycle of transgressive World War II movies. And uh, Burt Lancaster is really good at it. It does have a feel and a plot arc that is definitely something totally different than anything else you're going to get at that time. Yep, JDB was some Mitchell in movies. Uh, Yeah, uh, let's see. Justin says, saw Golden Needles in my local cinema in the 70s, haven't seen it since. Movies like that have been hard to find with a good transfer. Absolutely. So much of that great B picture 1970s kind of exploitation content is now being released by a whole bunch of different uh, studios. And that I like. Um, I know that the big uh, movie studios don't particularly like it, but owning physical media is becoming very niche. It's becoming. A boutique thing is becoming um, an indulgence because most people just want to see whatever's latest on streaming and fair enough uh, watching movies like this is not for everybody but for those of us who do love and know these movies uh, the fact that I can get a decent transfer of Castle Keep which previously I could only find on VHS and I've actually watched some VHS transfers recently on a, on a fairly recent new TV and the quality it disappoints. It's, it's the only thing I can say about it. Disappointing. And it's um, really good to see that a lot of these movies that I love and a lot of these movies that I remember from years gone by are now being produced in really nice formats and with the extras if you want extras, but in ways that make it a, a very comforting um, thing to sit on the couch and just watch these kind of movies. 
I've also got the soundboard going again today, so I've got uh, these kind of sounds coming through. Which, of course, is William Conroe from uh, The Naked Jungle. And I've also got uh, a bit of Betty Davis here, too. And here we go. There's the first bunch of porn spam coming up on the chat. Wonderful. Yeah, message to lead middle-aged geek girls onto it. And while we're waiting to get rid of that, here is the Betty Davis clip I've got. Which is a lot of fun. And then, of course, we've got George Sanders from also the same movie, All About Eve. No, that's okay, Lee. Uh, 7 p.m. where you are and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, we don't do Fahrenheit here. Fahrenheit's only for kind of marginal failed states these days. Hit 101 today at 4 p.m. Be safe with those sinuses. Do you get the sound, middle-aged good girl? Oh, that's a shame because of the soundboard. Hang on, let me just see whether I've got this tweaked right for the soundboard. Okay, uh, let, give me a sec. Did that one work for the soundboard? I'm just wondering. If the soundboard doesn't work, I'm very, very disappointed. Um, that doesn't matter. It's going to sound really weird on the... Um, on the stream and also when people play it back so sorry about that the soundboard doesn't work and i'm going to have to figure out why for future reference but um anyway 22 many high from wyoming failed state within a failed state yeah um you guys have got a lot i've got a lot of sympathy for you guys i've been to america but uh it's going to be a hard few years for american women and we really do have to acknowledge that and we we'll hope that um, things change and that things improve. And because I am basically an optimistic person, I believe they can. We had such a shit Australian government up until a month ago, which was an embarrassment, which was ruining international relations, which was totally wrecking the country. But when things got better, they got better very fast. And we've had a month of an intelligent and compassionate Australian government. And that um, really changes things. But uh, there's a lot of battles that America and Australia have ahead internally to defeat people who don't have the best interests of the culture of a country at heart. Uh, let's see. It's rainy and cooler there. Terry, could tell a little bit about Raymond Chow and his relationship with Bruce Lee in the studio, Golden. Uh, sometimes you went, um, well, yeah, I don't have a lot of information about the relationship because a lot of that was behind closed doors. A lot of the Bruce Lee negotiations with Raymond Chow and Golden Harvest were behind closed doors and people didn't talk about it. There weren't the leaks that we get now in modern times. I mean, it was a very lucrative relationship for both of them, but Bruce Lee wanted to play in a larger playground. So he started that relationship with Warner Brothers just before he died. Lee says, can't be as bad as Boris Johnson. Yeah, um, Scott Morrison was as bad as Boris Johnson. He was worse in the fact that he wasn't as intelligent as Johnson is. Yes, Johnson's a sociopath and is doing horrible things for the UK. But Morrison was not only damaging but dumb, and that's the big horrible thing about it. But um, we're kind of drifting off the subject. Going to go into it. Anybody want to see the bad movie that I bought? This week for one dollar. Let me know and I will tell you about the bad movie I bought this week for one dollar when I went down to my local charity shop. Middle aged geek girl says yes because I haven't shown it to her yet. Anybody else I want? Somebody who isn't related to me. Ian Triffitt says, Hi oh, yeah, Ian, how you doing, man? Um, always want to see one dollar. This one is uh, a movie that Dana Carvey made that's really bad, but I kind of like it. It's a movie called The Master of Disguise, where Dana Carvey plays a whole bunch of different characters. Um, it's a weird little film. It was produced, unfortunately, by um, Adam Sandler, a guy who I like as a character actor, but I don't particularly like his comedies because I find them mean-spirited. But this one is kind of a, a vulgar pleasure 
of movies. Yeah, Game of Trojan says I'll buy that for a dollar. You and Robocop. Uh, yeah, so I'm kind of looking forward to putting that one into the player and watching that. Though I've got a couple of other things in but I've got a couple of other things I want to watch before that. That's definitely going on to the coffee table in front of the TV. Yeah, it's a, a, it's a movie that's probably not going to get a big release again. So buying it on uh, DVD was a good move for that kind of thing. And um, it goes over there now. Grantman71 says, Turtle Guy I found was funny. Yeah, it's a funny movie in some ways. And if you go into it with the right mindset, you can kind of have a lot of fun with it. Let's see what else I got. Now, this one was problematic for me. But, um, I got it, did I get it for a buck, two bucks. This is like a classic big Hollywood film. Yeah, Dana Covey did have a great sketch show, lasted six episodes. Told the people with kids, little kids when it came out, I like it. Lee sent a super chat, $5, Lee Bronk. Thank you very much. Anthony Deal, uh, Singaporean, $10. Thank you very much, mate. Uh, 32 degrees in Singapore. I would love to go to Singapore because I want to hit hawker stalls and just eat, you know, things like nasi lemak until I burst. Uh, I probably can't afford to right now. In fact, I know I can't afford to right now. But I'd love to do, like, Singapore just for the food culture there. Let's see. Uh, Peter Cushion says, I'm close to buying a bad movie. Blood suckers, aka okay. incense for the damned. Have a bootleg copy already. Uh, let's see. Not a fascist slave says, I want to see the bad movie that you bought in a charity shop for a dollar. Yep, I did that one. Uh, yeah, Anthony, Singapore is, I've got a friend in Singapore, Devin. He's a really nice guy. And he keeps putting up on Facebook and other social media all this hawker food he buys. And it makes me hungry. And it makes me want to go there just for the hawker stalls. Really great. Anyway, the other one, $2 for this. Big tentpole movie of the 1960s. Famous director, David Lean's Dr. Zhivago. I picked it up on DVD. Now, the problem I've got with this, you know, it's a really great film. Uh, let's see what we've got. Geraldine Chapman, um, Omar Sharif, Julie Christie, Tom Courtney, Alec Guinness, Siobhan McKenna, Ralph Richardson, Rod Steiger, Ruta Tushingham, music by Marie Ja. The problem I've got with this one is, It's one of those ones, because it was such a long movie and such a big movie, it's one of those ones where the disc is double-sided and you've got to flip it halfway through the um, movie to watch it. And that's annoying. Now, it's a two-disc set because the other one is the disc of the extras, and uh, that's a double-sided disc as well. I may upgrade this if and when I get an opportunity to. But for $2... It's um it's worth doing and I want to watch it. Haven't really watched it all the way through. Uh watched parts of it at times. But for two dollars it was worth picking up uh because I'm the person who'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh Anthony says, Yeah, the food culture is amazing, hawker stores are affordable. Absolutely. Um Grantman seventy one, what do you think is better? Blu-ray or DVD digital remasking movies from the late seventies, early eighties? The higher resolution, the better for me. Uh, Blu-ray, definitely. Uh, if you're on a budget and you can only get the, can only afford the DVD, get it. Um, I, I'm on a budget at various times myself, and I do that. But it's kind of one of those things where you get the best quality that you can afford. And I'm not going to shame anybody for getting something that's kind of lower quality and without all the extras because that's what they can afford. The important thing at the heart of it is the movie. If you like the movie and you'll appreciate the movie, get what you can. Yeah, Game of Trojan says Blast from the Past, double-sided. I've got a few uh, up in the back room that are double-sided. They're annoying from a modern viewpoint, but I can understand it. I think it may be a bit of a hangover from the laser discs, and we talked about laser discs in the last video. But I want to just sit down and watch the movie all the way through without needing to get up and flip a disc and then have it all kind of happen again. Brian Lizzie says, I'm glad for punishment of what they came from beyond space on Blu-ray. Just want to see that guy with a colander on his head. No, definition. 
yeah, they came from Beyond Space is Weird. I think it's an Amicus movie. And it's got this crazy low budget aesthetic to it. And it's a science fiction movie made by people who don't understand science fiction movies. Justin says, double-sided DVDs have a bad habit of layer separation over time. Not many companies use DVD 18s anymore. There were so many complaints. Yeah. I can see that, but hopefully the Dr. Zhivago doesn't have that problem. Ian Trevor says, think of it as an interval. Yeah, remember when you go to the cinema to see a really big movie, and some people have this memory, some don't. And it's a long movie, and there'd be an intermission in the middle, and they'd play the music from the movie while the intermission was on, so people could rush out to the toilet and buy popcorn, come back, sit down, and then the movie starts. I know Ben Hu has got one of those. Um, yeah, I don't know whether it was done as a piss break uh, to give the projectionist a break or to sell more popcorn. Let me see. Yeah, William Thompson says, Criterion also puts out Isle of Lost Souls on Blu-ray, one of the best horror movies ever. If you're a fan of the band Diva, you probably know that it has an effect on their music. Yeah, we, Are We Not Men? All of that kind of thing. But uh, moderator Sally speaking, remember to smack that like button. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. Thank you, middle-aged geek girl. Love your work. 2001 Space Odyssey had one. Uh, yeah, 2001 Space Odyssey is a weird movie for me. I've told this story once before, but I'll tell it again. Saw it about 20 years ago in a cinema in the Astor in, in Melbourne here, which is the only single-screen cinema left in Melbourne. And they got to the scene where um, the two astronauts are floating around and uh, Kid Jule has got to retrieve the body of the Gary Lockwood character from space. And it's a very slow scene with lots of heavy breathing in it. And I actually reached for the remote control to fast forward through that part of the movie while I was in the cinema. Slow science fiction movies that don't value add in the slowness really um, piss me off. Uh, Charles Lawton in the movie and Bela Lugosi's Speaker of Law was wonderful. Yeah, the physical acting Bela Lugosi does as the Speaker of the Law is really interesting in Island of Lost Souls. Is that a coffee cup from Cthulhu Bucks Coffee? I guess you cover the logo for copyright strike purposes. Not particularly. There's a Starbucks around the corner and I couldn't be stuffed making a big pot of coffee this morning because I had to get ready for the live stream. Yeah, J, uh, J. Trim says, I'm old enough to remember the intermission when you ran up to the lobby for a smoke. Well, some people did. I didn't, but that's okay. Uh, Game of Treasure says, will I ever cover TV series? Yeah, I will. I have done in the past, and I will do that again. And uh, the problem with covering a TV series is I've got to watch a lot of episodes, and that takes up a lot of time. DK Moss says, I saw the original 70mm print at the Science Museum in London. Yeah, the one I saw was the 70mm print of that. And here we go with the porn spam again, and Sally is on the game getting rid of it. Um, Lee says, what are my thoughts on Star Trek, the motion picture? Yeah, I think that um, I'm not particularly in love with Robert Wise as a director. I think that he was a hack who ripped apart Orson Welles, the magnificent Ambersons. And I never, I never thought of him as a great director. And I think that there are parts of that that could have been shortened and given us more of the people stuff. And Star Trek: The Motion Picture would have been great. I mean, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I'm really enjoying Strange New Worlds at the moment, uh, the new series of Star Trek, because it's kind of gone back to old school Star Trek, but it's actually um, updating it from modern era. And the ensemble works, the cast works. And the stories are pretty much on point as well. Yeah, uh, that was a different uh, when they uh, double-sided video discs, but they used to do that at laser disc in the country when they first came out. You had to stop the movie and put the disc, back, disc sheets back in the machine. Yeah, the struggle was real. Uh, streaming, people say streaming is the best way to do it, but I kind of like the idea of sticking a disc into a, a drive and watching a movie. There's something physical about doing that, that I really appreciate. Grandma 71, I'll uh, put you up there with Roger Ebert and Rex Reed when it comes to reviews of First Class all the way. Thank you. I wish I had their money. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, can a uh, yeah, sapphire and steel game with Trojan? Yeah. Uh, sapphire and steel, I've kind of had a little trouble getting my head around, but I really should watch it. I've got it on disc. So I should do that. Yeah, bots are back. Uh, yeah, I, I don't mind Star Trek The Motion Picture. I like the fact that it brought back the ensemble. Of course, the second one, Star Trek through The Wrath of Khan, is the gold standard on Star Trek movies. It really did everything right, and it really saved that franchise from oblivion almost. Don't, middle-aged good girl says, I've got to review Hotel Transylvania. She keeps telling me to review that, but I'm not going to because I don't want to. Uh, let's see, Anthony D. I can remember watching Hooper in a local cinema with a comfort break. Quite helpful in this respect. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things. When you get to be a certain age like me, one of the great things to do is to really um, see if you can sit through a three-hour movie without needing to go for a leak. There we go. Thank you for that. Sal, you've earned your money today. Uh, or the Greg, hi, from Houston, Texas. Hi, Greg. I uh, hope everything's cool there. Hope you're staying cool in the summertime. Here it's um, winter. Though uh, at the moment it's, it's fairly mild for our winter, so I'm kind of happy with that. Lee Lavery says, I did love McCoy's to get up though. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he could boogie with the best of them. Doctor Who with Peter Cushing as a doctor. Um, I think that, uh, that those two movies, the two Peter Cushing Doctor Who movies, are getting a Blu-ray release here in Australia again. So that people are going to be able to watch them in high definition. And they've actually been shown as a double feature in a couple of cinemas as well. So that's kind of interesting at the moment. Middle-aged geek girl says, what money? And you Greg Khan. Billy Jack was the first socially aware kung fu movie, I think. Problem with Billy Jack is two things. Mostly Tom Lachlan. And mostly it, um, it was very heavy-handed in the way it did things. It didn't have the right touch for what it did. And it was all just an excuse to beat people up. And, uh, yeah, Billy Jack, a lot of people like. But I kind of didn't like the undercover fascism of what he did. It's a really weird thing. If there was a more charismatic actor in it rather than Tom Lockman, I think it may have worked better. And if somebody who could um, write a decent script was involved with it, it would have worked a lot better for me. But, uh, yeah, it's very heavy-handed and very kind of didactic um, for things. Now, uh, let's see what else we've got. I'll, yeah, I'll drag this one out because I want to recommend it. It's not something I bought recently, but it's a, a hidden gem of kind of creepy um, serial killer movies, in a sense. From the 1960s, it's a little film directed by Joseph Cates. Who I think it's Phoebe Cates' dad called Who Killed Teddy Bear, starring Sal Mineo and Juliet Prowse. And Sal Mineo plays a kind of sex-crazed killer in this one. It's a black-and-white film, low-budget as hell. But Who Killed Teddy Bear, apart from having a really good theme song, is a really creepy um, little hidden gem of a 1960s movie. It's got Elaine Stricker as well, playing a lesbian nightclub owner. There's some disco music, uh, and there's a few extras in here. Uh, an episode of a 1960s legal drama starring Sal Minio, um, an LSD documentary for some reason, but who killed Teddy Bear? you got to find a copy of this somewhere because it is really a deeply creepy um, hidden gem of a kind of serial killer prowler kind of movie. Yeah, uh, Jay Altrim, you should check out Who Cooked Teddy Bear again because it really does work. And Sal Mineo is really good in it. Um, Billy Jack movies inspired me to buy Bong Sung Han's Hapkido book as a kid. There's a good movie called Hapkido as well, which has Angela Ma Yin in it. Uh, it's kind of almost a, a gender flipped remake of Fist of Fury, but it works really well. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Clint Eastwood tries to be socially aware, but always leaves me feeling he remains an urban cowboy, so I understand what you're saying. Yeah, Clint Eastwood, um, I liked him singing in Paint Your Wagon. I like the fact that he sang so badly in Paint Your Wagon. Though, of course, Lee Marvin stole that movie from him. And there are Clint Eastwood movies I like, but I think that 
he's a little bit difficult. I mean, I didn't like the Dirty Harry movies. I think a cop out of control is not something that plays well to a modern audience, particularly people of colour in in certain parts of the world. But there are Clint Eastwood movies I like. I like the Argus Sanctuary. I think that works really well as a kind of spy thriller set on a mountain. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the um, Clint Eastwood, he's kind of in that same category for me as Tom Cruise, where I like certain Tom Cruise movies, but I don't like Tom Cruise. And I think that's the same for me with Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood was the seventh choice for Dirty Harry. Yeah, I really think they should have gone for Wally Cox or somebody like that. Uh, Wally Cox would have made a great Dirty Harry. Echo, hi, how are you doing? Sorry that you're up so late to watch the live stream. What do you miss? Um, well, you can always go back and watch the live stream when I put it up as a permanent video. At the moment, I'm putting up the things I've bought recently. Uh, Darren Bennett says, enjoyed the session of Brewer Limited last night. Thanks for the recommendation. My pleasure. It is a lot of fun, though. I think that in the third act, they don't give Diana Rigg enough to do. But, uh, yeah, hi, Echo. Um, yeah, and thank you for the support of the channel, too. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see what we've got. Zinner will get me for that cruise remark. I don't care. I mean, I don't believe in deities, especially ones that throw people into volcanoes. But yeah, who else could we have for um, Dirty Harry who would be better than Clint Eastwood? Let's see. Charles Nelson Riley would have been good. Um, Dick York or even Dick Sargent would have been cool. I know, the ultimate. I've decided who I want to be Dirty Harry if I was going back in time and making a Dirty Harry movie. You ready for this? Paul Lind. Paul Lind would have been the perfect Dirty Harry. Burgess Meredith would have been okay. The, uh, Eddie Deason, uh, Eddie Deason's problematic. Eddie Deason recently got into a lot of shit for harassing a teenage girl in a cafe. She worked there and he started getting incredibly creepy to her. I was a Facebook friend with Eddie Deason, but he got to that stage of being such a creepy bastard. I really had, yeah, Wally Cox, absolutely Wally Cox. I like Wally Cox. I think he's one of those really underestimated actors. Uh, do I know a movie with the title Pentagon Wars? Echo. Uh, let me just do a quick Google search on Pentagon Wars. This is going to be interesting for everybody to listen to Keith Clatter. Who did you do? Tulsi Grammer, Richard Benjamin. 1998 uh, military comedy. We are, let's see, we're Kelsey Grammer, Carrie Elwes, Olympia Dukakis, Richard Benjamin. Uh, let's see. Directed by Richard Benjamin. I should check that out. Uh, let's see. When I was younger, I got the impression Born Free was filmed in New Zealand or Australia. Was it Africa? Larry Hagman would have been a shit dirty Harry. Uh, what is it with boomers being creepy, says middle-aged good girl? Not all of us are. Some of us are charming as fuck. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, charming AF. And um, some of us are not. Let's see. All the Greeks is black folks and Hispanics. No, we're big Dirty Harry fans. 70s was lawless times and people were sick of being victims. Yeah, but on the other hand, letting some guy with poor impulse control have um, a gun never ends well. I think Dirty Harry is one of those movies that, yeah, in its time it was interesting, but in retrospect and with the... Uh, wonderful wisdom of hindsight, less so. Alvy Moore is Dirty Harry. Alvy Moore was really good in The Brotherhood of Satan. He was actually one of the producers of it as well. Um, yeah, I can only imagine because he was Dirty Harry. Just consider ourselves lucky we never got Charles Bronson as Dirty Harry. Charles Bronson, uh, if you go to Tubi.tv, you can watch Charles Bronson's early TV series, Man with a Camera, which has got like half-hour episodes made on a crazily low budget, but they've got good guest stars. And Bronson does pretty well playing a former combat photographer who goes and has adventures around the world. And there are a number of episodes of Man with a Camera on Tubi. 
and I'd never seen it before. And uh, I don't mind dropping in and indulging in an episode or two every now and then. Donna Pass Whiskey says, greetings from Northern California. Yeah, you guys have got a drought at the moment, haven't you? Though I believe that um, El Nino is going to come back soon and you should get more rain there. But uh, no Northern California is really suffering from those droughts. And that's the thing. Both sides of the Pacific, either one side of the Pacific has got droughts or our side of the Pacific has got droughts. Leslie Nielsen is Dirty Harry. Well, Leslie Nielsen kind of did that with the Naked Gun movies, which are a lot of fun and uh, there are a lot of kind of deep cut jokes. Death Wish uh, reflected that as well. Yeah, Death Wish, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of Death Wish. Um, Peter Cushion say, says, the Death Wish films are guilty pleasures for me, but as you say, they are problematic. Yeah. Uh, you could say he was majestic in the role. I don't have a, um, a kind of drum, boom, tish drum thing for that. Yeah, Mr. Majestic, I liked when I saw it in the 70s because, you know, I kind of like the idea of, of shooting watermelons with shotguns. Uh, that really uh, appealed to me at that time. But I, I might want to revisit Mr. Majestic. I know it's got a Blu-ray release in the last few years, so uh, I may well look at that. Sean Connery, The Man with the Deadly Lens, was a very up movie for today. Yeah, I re-watched that a little while ago. I think I watched it on one of my 24-hour movie marathons on the channel. And, yeah, it is very much... Uh, kind of forward-looking and prophetic movie in a lot of ways, which is kind of strange, but it, it did turn out to be that way. Platoon better than Apocalypse Now. I think there's room for both of them. Uh, there's parts of Apocalypse Now I like. I don't think Marlon Brando is one of them. But that going up the river and that kind of Joseph Conrad feel is uh, is something that I think that Coppola did well. Platoon I haven't watched for a long time. Uh, and uh, maybe should watch it again. Uh, Oliver Stone had first-hand knowledge of that kind of stuff, and I've got to respect that. Death Wish novel is very different from the movie, and, yeah, I think Brian Garfield wrote the novel. And here we go. We're getting the porn spam again. You have Donna Passwick. Yeah, third year of drought. Also, electric utility is getting good at burning large parts of the state down due to 80-plus years of neglect of the grid. Yeah, but we're having problems with that too. We've got a few um, issues with... Uh, electricity grids here and it all comes down to privatization they privatized electric grids about 25 years ago here before that they were owned by state governments and they ran really well when they were all run by state governments because there was a direct kind of um, responsibility and a direct line to the public if they didn't like the way the public was running the utilities they'd vote them out of government Jay Trim says uh Let's see, uh, Philly of World of Giants, 50 series with Marshall Thompson as a 16th age. I've heard of it, and I think I've watched one episode. Uh, better actor for uh, Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now would have been Burt Lancaster. Yeah, Lancaster, fine actor. Uh, the interesting thing is there are a few really good actors who are also good with the physicality of action films. And for me, Burt Lancaster hit both. Who would I cast as Colonel Kurtz instead of Brando? That's a good question. Who would I cast? Let's see. I'm trying to think back to the 70s. I think Gene Hackman could have done a good job of it. Uh, he might have been an interesting choice there. Um, maybe. Uh, here's a really off-the-wall idea. Harry Dean Stanton playing Colonel Kurtz. I think he may have, uh, because Colonel Kurtz is a disintegrating man. And uh, Harry Dean Stanton would have been interesting for that. Yeah, to be honest, I don't have an issue with most problematic of old films. They are of their time, Peter Cushion. I agree, but I think that when I'm reviewing them here, I've got to acknowledge those problematic things while I'm reviewing them. Um, for me, and that's just the way I have to be if I'm going to review them. If I'm reviewing a, a movie from the 1950s and it's got some kind of nasty sexual politics in it, I'll acknowledge that and review the movie. But I think the acknowledgement, putting it in a historical context, for me, at least, is very important. Yeah, the Richies too. Uh, yeah, the Crimson Pirates, fantastic. Christopher Lee is in the Crimson Pirate. What, really great. It's got anachronisms all over the place. It doesn't take itself seriously. It's one of the great, fun Burt Lancaster movies. And I'm going to add it into a video I'm going to do in the future about 
children's movies that I think still stand up well. And I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to put Thief of Baghdad. The Crimson Pirate is just fun. Lee Van Cleef as Colonel Kurtz. That's possible. Uh, Burton brute force. Yeah, absolutely. Burton Lancaster Phantom. Sterling Hayden did disintegrating quite well. By the way, one of the, I'm, I've actually got a Sterling Hayden book right here, and I'm, I'm going to talk about um, movie books that I like. This is a memoir by Sterling Hayden where he quit Hollywood for a while and took his four kids on a cruise in the Pacific in a sailing boat. There's a thing called Wanderer, and it's written really well. Um, Sterling Hayden was a fine writer apart from being an actor. And Wanderer, if you can find a copy of this, it's a really nice memoir of a guy who got totally over Hollywood shit in the, in the 1950s and went away for a while. Really uh, recommendation there. So thanks for bringing up Sterling Hayden. Frederick Mark was outstanding in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde would never be made that way nowadays with CG. Yeah, uh, Frederick March was really good. I even think Spencer Tracy was kind of good in his version. Uh, Gavin Trish, I haven't reviewed the original Thing movie. I really should. I like Howard Hawks. And um, I like the way Howard Hawks handled something that wasn't in a genre he knew anything about. I think the original version of the thing is, is fantastic. Yep, uh, let's see, Echo. Uh, what about the Matt Helm movies with Dean Martin as Matt Helm? Yeah, um, I watched them when I was a kid. They actually put them on kids' matinees at uh, 12 o'clock on a Saturday. And we got all the Matt Helm films to watch, even though they were a little racy for children. We got to see all of that and... Um, enjoy people like Stella Stevens and Janice Page and, and all those other people who are in the Dean Martin Matt Helm movies. I've got the box set of DVDs of that um, as well. Have I seen the Quatermass BBC shows from the 50s on DVD anywhere? They're on YouTube and other places. Donna uh, yeah, I think I've got – No, I know somebody who got them. I know they, you know, the UK have put them out on maybe DVD or Blu-ray. And if you've got a, a zone region free Blu-ray player, you can watch them. But they are definitely on DVD out there. There are a couple of missing episodes and a couple of the stories because the BBC didn't retain the originals. But they're definitely out there, Donna Pass Whiskey. Going through the coffee really fast. Uh, what else did I pick up? Uh, there's a couple of other things. This one's got um, I got because it's got Audrey Hepburn, Alistair Sim, and it's a Chinese version of it, uh, of a movie called Laughter in Paradise. Old school English comedy. I can't really tell too much about it because on the back, most of the liner notes are in Chinese. But I picked this up for a dollar, and it's worth checking out because Alistair Sim, Audrey Hepburn, Interesting comedy, hopefully. Uh, let's see what I pay for that, a dollar. So uh, I did okay. Just be one moment. <coughs> Hit the mute button. Yeah, Back to the Future on VHS sold for $75,000 last week. And, uh, yeah, uh, I've got a couple of VHS tapes. I've got a... VHS, Australian VHS of Mad Max has never been watched. So I should find out whether that's worth anything. Uh, <laughs> Middle-aged girls says, get a lot of $1 bargains. I do. It's a matter of scrounging through all of the crap and all of the box sets of Friends and um, Midsummer Murders and things like that to find them. Yeah, Moonraker um, it was basically a Matt Helm movie on a much bigger budget. Yeah, I hated Roger Moore as James Bond. I didn't mind him as a saint. Thought he was okay that I thought he was good in the persuaders. But he was too light for James Bond. Really didn't like him at all. And uh, after a while, particularly in the later films, he got to be embarrassingly bad. And that gen that age gap between him and his leading ladies was at the end of things very creepy. What do I think about the Macau movie with Bruce Campbell? I try not to. Um, I like Bruce Campbell. And it was good seeing him do a cameo in um, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. But, uh, yeah, 
I think that habit that people had of remaking old TV series as movies was kind of ill-considered in for the most part. Sometimes it worked. Mission Impossible at work for a couple of other things it worked for. But there was that, there was that really bad Starsky and Hutch movie, which I saw in Scotland, oddly enough. Um, yeah. Yeah, Echo says, I like all the Bond movies. Yeah, no, fair enough. We can disagree. We can agree to disagree on that because uh, Roger Moore didn't like, like all of the Daniel Craig ones, I think all of them worked as a continuing story, which is an odd choice that uh, Ian Productions made, but I think it paid off in the end. Yeah, Bubba Hotep definitely, Lee. Bubba Hotep is a lot of fun. Much better Elvis than apparently the um, Baz Luhrmann version. That movie is getting a hammering at the moment. And I've never been a fan of Baz Luhrmann. Um, I think that he is all sound and fury signifying nothing, and he never actually adds any depth to all of the spectacular visuals. Someone told me that um, Baz Luhrmann movies are a trailer for a much better film. Yeah, um, Campbell was great in Chloramo as well. Yeah, best bomb was Connery. I'm kind of dithering between Bonnery and Craig. I think both of them are very much up there. Which is just, I did an animal uh, bomb marathon on Prime. Made it as far as Tomorrow Never Dies before they dropped off the service. That's the problem. Physical media doesn't drop off the service. Um, I really should do another video just talking about physical media versus streaming. I've been asked to uh, talk about it on the ABC, actually. Uh, I'm going to be doing a thing for the ABC on one of their podcasts, the, the local national broadcaster. Uh, there's a thing called The Pineapple Project where they talk about how to save money. I'm going to talk about how to save money on streaming services. But uh, When A Bill's Told with Anthony Hopkins, yeah, that one works. It, it's kind of like not quite Bond, but a good, honest kind of action spy drama. More in Cannonball Run. Cannonball Run isn't as good as Cannonball. The original one that was done by Roger Corman, which has David Carradine and a whole bunch of Roger Corman alumni in it, for me is a lot more fun than Cannonball Run. But what else we got? Um, I wanted to talk about a movie that people hate. You want to hear me talk about a movie that people hate? Gumball <laughs> pretended it. Um, thanks, don't forget to watch what Chris Just one more. Do I know the Italian movie The Spaghetti Man? No, I don't. Send me a link. Uh, I actually hit the mute button, dude. I thought I had hit the mute. Is that the mute button? Is that what? Dark Star. I've covered Dark Star in a previous video. So, yeah, just one movie people like. I uh, love Gumball Ready. I think for Peter Saras. Uh, um, yeah. Was that Michael Sarazen? Uh, having problems with aging DVDs distraught? No, I don't. Uh, for some reason, I don't. Hopefully, it's because things are nice and dry where I am and so that we don't get any um, mold and things like that to do disc right. But um, I rewatched a movie that I watched in the cinemas just a little while ago. And I watched it on the 4K. And I liked it. Um, it's it's copped a lot of shit for a lot of reasons, but I kind of really liked the Batman with Robert Pattinson, directed by Matt Reeves. Um, it's got a good supporting cast in it as well. Um, Zoe Kravitz is very good as Selena Kyle. You've also got um, Jeffrey Wright playing Commissioner Gordon, doing a really nice job of it. And it's got a wonderful aesthetic to it. This hits a lot of contemporary issues. The Gotham you get in the Batman is one that's being affected by climate change. It's raining incessantly, and that plays into the third act of the movie. But it's got those kind of extreme weather conditions things that we're actually now experiencing in real life. Robert Pattinson is a good Batman, and people go, well, he's got emo hair when he's playing Bruce Wayne. The My take on it is Bruce Wayne doesn't give a shit about how he looks. He doesn't give a shit about getting a haircut. Bruce Wayne is actually the secret identity of Batman. And at least for most of the movie, 
Pattinson's Bruce Wayne wants to be Batman more than he wants to be Bruce Wayne. The visual aesthetic of this movie I like a lot. There's some really great stabilised footage where the, um, the stabilisation is the, the uh, it's one of those shots where the camera is attached to the side of a car during a car chase. And the car is stabilised, but all the background is jittery. They do some really nice digital production on that. It has a really interesting use of depth of field to emphasise the visuals. And the Riddler is usually a joke in Batman movies, but this time the Riddler is one of the creepiest Batman villains, probably almost up there with Heath Ledger's Joker. It really is something a bit different, and a lot of people didn't get that. Yeah, Trevor says, oh, I think it's very well made, but can't handle Batman as a character in a realistic film. I really like Pattinson, though. I, I kind of liked it. I, I like that realism. The cartooniness of Tim Burton's Batman is uh, gone, yeah. Yeah, Batman has a running time of three hours. Uh, Pattinson's jaw has its own agent. Yeah, well, you can't criticise people for their appearances. A lot of the Batman was filmed in my city, Liverpool, UK. I can't see that. Um, it's, it's definitely got uh, that look of Liverpool. But uh, let's see, I haven't seen it yet. I'm not going to do any spoilers on the Batman. Apart from saying that the third act really does slam hard. And also, uh, this is kind of early in the Bruce Wayne's career as a Batman. It's like the first year. It's almost like Batman Year One, and here comes the point again. Um, yeah, it's almost like Batman Year One, and he's learning the job. And there's a moral change in Bruce Wayne slash the Batman that occurs during the film when he sees the consequences of his actions and his approach to things. And I think that lands really well. The movie has a lot to say about vigilantism. Justin Kibber, um, I think that superhero narratives are a broad church. You can have non-serious ones, you can have serious ones, you can have ones that talk about a lot of issues in the same way you can with Westerns, the same way you can with um, crime movies, the same way you can with science fiction. I think that there's room for a bunch of different stories told a bunch of different ways. And not, not everyone's going to be for everybody. But I like the fact that nobody's just playing the straight and narrow when it comes to superhero narratives. I, I like that variety and that diversity. And for me, that works a lot. I mean, on one hand, you've got the boys. And on the other hand, you've got, um, say, the TV series The Flash. They're very, very different superhero narratives. And they're both on streaming services. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of comfortable with that. Not a fascist slave for. I was born in the UK. I grew up in the States. Um, so the difference to me is miles versus kilometers. Some in Glasgow too. Yeah, we went through Glasgow and, and didn't stay there. We actually stayed in Edinburgh, but we um, should have spent more time in Glasgow. The Richie 2 says, I have serious superhero burnout at this point. Yeah, that's fair enough, dude. Watch some other movies. Watch The Umbrellas of Schaborg or um, Young Girls of Rochefort or High and Low, the Kurosawa movie. Kind of cleanse your palate a little bit. Don't speak of The Flash. It's a no no. I was talking about the TV series Middle Age Geek Girl. I wasn't talking about Ezra Miller's repugnant behavior. Grandma, uh, they do sell Kenny in Canada. I wish they sold in movies. What's Kenny? Um, you collect a lot of physical media, people aren't. Hi. Uh, you collect a lot of physical media. How long do you reckon physical media has left in the tank in terms of new releases? I think that it may get to the stage where a lot of things aren't going to come out on physical media, particularly the big mainstream things. But I think that there's a growing niche boutique physical media um, kind of thing there. And I've just hit the microphone boom arm. Um, I think that there's a, a growing one where people who are physical media fans, just like the people who are like vinyl fans and who don't uh, put everything on Spotify, no media dies. It just changes its position in the hierarchy of things. 
And I think physical media for a lot of people is great. And I think that there may be increasing numbers of people who appreciate it because the things they love are going to disappear from the streaming services. Um, one of the things I'm going to be saying when I, I do that chat on the radio is that if you love a movie and you're really passionate about it and you want to keep re-watching it now and then, keep a DVD or Blu-ray player and buy a physical copy of that movie because you can't rely on the streaming service to make it available forever. It will disappear like that and you won't be able to see it. Which Flash series? Um, I like the 1991, uh, John Wesley Ship, and I also like parts of the new one with Grant Gustin. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I sort out my DVD, um, Mr. Yusgenzi. Yeah, I sort out my, all my DVD and Blu rays a couple of weeks ago. A lot more tidy in my living room cabinet. Yeah, I can do that. I've got some software which I use for scanning the barcodes on my DVDs and Blu rays, and I'll let you know what it is. I've just forgotten the name, so I'll open up the phone and tell you what this software is called. It's 20 bucks a year Australian to, um, to have the software, but it's worth it. It's called CLZ Movies. And you scan the barcodes and it'll let you do a cloud upload. So if you lose your phone or whatever, you've still got access to it. And I just scan the barcodes of the movies on, on when I get them. And they're automatically uploaded into the database. It's really useful for when I go hunting for movies, particularly in charity stores. I can quickly see whether I've already got it. And that saved me a few bucks the other day. Uh, let's see, Gremlin 71. Here, Maverick may never be released on physical media. Yeah, that'd be a shame. I like the Maverick TV series. But I think you might be talking about Top Gun Maverick, uh, which is not going to be a particular loss for me because I didn't like the first Top Gun. Uh, yeah, streaming is more for casual viewers anyway, and after sorting out all uh, my Lexus was the next day. Um, Donna Pass Whiskey. True, most of his stuff on streaming is unwatchable garbage to me. Want the old obscure stuff? Yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing about there are two streaming services if you want old stuff. Tubi.tv. And increasingly, Plex has got some really interesting older stuff in there. There are also um, some streaming services like Shudder, which are doing older horror movies for some to some extent. But um, I like the idea of st old streaming old movies on free streaming services like um, Tubi, because Tubi's got some really interesting hidden gems, along with a lot of crap. Yep, yeah, uh, middle aged girl. I have a spreadsheet for my console games I use when I mean EB games or similar. Yep, yeah, you need to have that up so you don't double up. Um, Echo says, I just quit Netflix because they lost Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, they did lose Star Trek Disco. Though for me, Strange New Worlds is better than Disco. Yeah, Justin Kimber, you're right, mate. Streaming services can also edit movies and remove series episodes that are problematic. Just another reason I collect hard copies of movie series and music. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things, and, and the person that started that, of course, is George Lucas, who went and finger painted over a whole bunch of his older movies because he could. And people now are spending primo bucks to get physical copies of the Star Wars movies untouched by George Lucas's finger painting. Yeah, Dwayne, Netflix lost a bunch. I think one of the problems, and that just segues nicely into what I'll talk about next. Might be so. Netflix is doing kind of B pictures, and it's doing them in a, a kind of interesting way. I watched the new one on Netflix uh, for the radio gig where I talk about movies on the radio. A thing called Spiderhead with Chris Hemsworth, Miles Teller, and Journey Smollett in it. It's about a kind of weird open prison where the inmates are tested with pharmaceuticals that alter emotional moods. And Hemsworth's the bad guy in that. And it's got a really nice aesthetic. It's got a lot of 1980s yacht rock music on the soundtrack, along with some very random stuff like the Swingle Singers. And it's um, it's based on a short story, which is, apparently is quite good, a good short story. And 
the movies, the first two thirds of the movie are great. It, it sets up an interesting premise where these um, prisoners are being experimented on in a, a kind of a mixed gen, gender pr open prison. It's kind of like a kind of 1980s brutalist holiday resort. And they set up the premise nicely and then they raise moral questions. And Hemsworth's trying to expand as an actor, so he's playing the bad guy uh, and kind of almost nails the creepiness that's necessary for the role, but doesn't quite. And then they shit the third act. The third act in the novel, uh, sorry, in the short story, <coughs> the third act in the short story lands the premise wonderfully. It's got a nice ending. But the Netflix version of Spiderhead shits the, does the obvious thing, does exactly what you know is going to happen at the end of the movie. And they don't care because people have watched the movie by the time they find that out. And so Netflix has got it. It's not. The other thing Netflix did was they convinced the Australian government to spend $21 million Australian to make that movie. Uh, the Australian government, the previous one, the, the nasty one we had before our current government, which is a month old now, spent $21 million of taxpayer money to make a third-rate movie for Netflix filmed in Queensland here in Australia. And there's a few good things in this movie, but the ending really did infuriate me because it did the exact obvious thing. Let's see, Noel Cleaning says, I haven't, I've taken a fair number of DVDs out of the cases, put them in DVD walls to save space. Yeah, um, keep, keep the sleeves. You can always, if you want to sell them, you can always buy new cases. But uh, keep the sleeves, but uh, get rid of the plastic. If you have, if you have space concerns, I totally understand that. Uh, Grandma 71 says, I find the X-Files collection is now very hard to find on DVD. That's interesting. Middle-aged good girl says, X-Files have an incest episode. The streaming services are not showing. You can only see it if you have the DVD sets. The Richie 21 hand shot first. Yep. Speaking of shot, have I seen Mad God? No, I want to see Mad God. I think Phil Tippett's an interesting animator. And I want to see Mad God, but I haven't had a chance to yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, Echo says, only hand shot in 1970. So I was to kill Greedo. Yeah, uh, 21 million, where do I sign up? Yeah, that's the thing. They also did it for that really shit Baz Luhrmann movie, Australia. A ton of government money went into making that movie, and it was PPO, piss poor and ordinary. It was really not a good film, and the Australian government keeps throwing money at exactly the wrong movies, which is kind of problematic. They should be doing there. There are a whole bunch of smaller Australian films. Leah Purcell just did a movie called The Drover's Rot Wife, which I want to see because I hear incredible good things about it. But it was made with no government money and it's a strong story with Indigenous themes. And I would rather see my taxpayer money go to a movie like that than go to something facile that's going to disappear from Netflix in 12 months. Because there's Bas, uh, Baz Luhrmann, Lars Berman, directed the latest Elvis biopic. That one's getting hammered, Echo, in the media. Um, particularly, they're saying that uh, Tom Hanks looks a lot like Goldmember and acts a lot like a Goldmember in an Austin Powers movie. Yeah, Lee says, PPO, uh, got to remember that acronym. Absolutely. Uh, Dwayne says, uh, Tubi is better. Dark Shadows from the 60s is on there. Yeah, I just noticed that, but I'm not going down that rabbit hole because there are like 25 million episodes of Dark Shadows. Donna Pass Whiskey, they recently remastered Babylon 5 and put it on HBO streaming, but don't know if they offer it as a hard copy. I would like to get that. Yeah, I've got the old Babylon 5 with the kludgy um, Amiga effects. And I, I like it. I think it's a precursor to a lot of good science fiction that's followed. And it needs to be acknowledged that I believe they are doing a reboot of it. And I'd be interested in seeing what they do with that. Uh, I know that uh, Straczynski is doing that. Let's see, what else have we got? Uh, that's it for the videos we got. I was actually going to talk about some movie books that I want to recommend as well. 
Uh, middle aged geek girl says, and clergy acting. You are being very critical there, girl. Okay, let's see. I've got about six or seven movie books I want to recommend because sometimes books are good. Let's see. Ian Trevor, the remaster of Apple 5 is available at Apple TV for $50 ownership. Looks great, much better than the DVD release. Okay, I'm not going to pay $50 for a streaming service ownership that they'll take away from me. Grantman 71, the only available X Files episodes are at five bucks per episode. Um, Echo says, Oh, yeah, Secrets DSV has Amiga effects. The Amiga 2000 with huge graphics capability. Uh, yeah, I think they had Video Toaster along with uh, the Amiga to make those. Brian Lindsay says, There are approximately 1,250 episodes of Dark Shadows, but each is only 20 minutes long. I uh, enjoyed the hell out of it. Watched five or six episodes a week. Yeah, I can see that. But at the moment, because of the commitments I've got, I've got two videos for this channel. I've got the radio. And I've got other things that pop up. I don't have time to do a long binge. Yeah, um, Donna Passworks, Babylon 5 was with a couple of different networks. It's crazy where the rights are. But Straczynski knows how to negotiate and to navigate that kind of problem. So I really want to see what's going on there. There's some money to be made, to be available for those kinds of things, and I think it'll work well. And that's the end of the coffee. Uh, let's see. Yep, um, Middle East Google, you should get into Dark Shadows. You might have a bit of fun with it. It's got vampires and werewolves and witches and things. So that may well be um, your next binge. And I will see you in 2025 after you've finished. Grantman 71. The first four seasons of Dark Shadows are excellent. Okay, yeah. Uh, I like the idea of a soap opera science fiction TV series. Oh, sorry, horror TV series. Lee says, I remember my mum watching Dark Shadows in the midday television during the weekdays. It was a running horror soap opera. It was. Yeah, all well, the Greg Babylon 5 was my favorite. Also, look forward to the new version. Yeah, uh, Babylon 5, I think, worked well. Uh, there are a few bits of it that are kind of icky, like the, the sexual politics in it are a bit icky, but it was of the 90s. What do I think of the movie Moonfall from Roland Emmerich? I did a video about that, Echo. If you look back, Moonfall is one of the movies I've done on that. I think it's dumb fun. I don't think that. The premise is crazy and absurd, but I think it's dumb fun. And if you just kind of roll with the aesthetic and roll with the silliness of it, you can have a good time watching it. Lee says, never heard of Dark Shadows before. It looks fantastic. Yeah, Tubi. Hit it up on Tubi. Try a few episodes, see what you think with that. But on to movie books. Got to take some control here. This one should be in everyone's library because it's fantastic. It talks about how movies are made. So if you want to know how sausages are made, this one, William Goldman, who wrote things like Marathon Man, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, any number of things, did a book about his career in Hollywood, and it's called Adventures in the Screen Trade. This is the second copy of this that I've got because the first copy fell apart from reading it. It's one of the great movie books about how classic Hollywood films are made. And it doesn't pull punches. And that's um, what I like. Oiler Greg says, Depp movie of Dark Shadows was fun pop popcorn flick. Uh, don't get me started on Johnny Depp. Uh, we will end up, I'll end up losing subscribers. We're on to water now that the coffee's gone. <laughs> Open up the water. Let's see. Yeah, a lot of the politics of B5 were taken up from the lead up to World War II and the USS Russia Cold War. Yep. Lewis Bumwell's autobiography, My Last Breath, is fascinating. Thank you for that, Noel. I'll have to try to find that. Um, I'll go back through the chat and find that. By the way, people can do super chats if they want to. So, having said that about the William Goldman book, he did a second one called Which Lie Did I Tell More Adventures in the Screen Trade? Which is about his later thing uh, with Princess Bride, Misery, Maverick, 
and Absolute Power working with Mel Gibson, Michael Douglas, and Clint Eastwood discussing the works. Um, and also, he does a virtual writer's clinic on classic moments in great screenplays, including North by Northwest. There's something about Mary. A really great uh, book. Peter Cushing, yeah. Um, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, Peter Biskin. Yeah, that's great. I've got a few Peter Biskin books here. Are there any Australian scary dark series, Terry? Uh, only parliamentary question time. But uh, there are Australian movies that are dark and scary, The Babadook being one of them. And there's also a thing called The Well, which is very dark and scary. And uh, The Inn of the Damned, there are a bunch of them in the 1970s. Patrick, of course, uh, a whole bunch of them, but uh, not really any scary dark series particularly. Uh, I love My Last Breath, one of my favourite movie books, is Getting Away With It, which combines Steven Soderbergh's movie diaries with his letters to Richard Lester, Ian. That, that sounds fantastic. Um, Dick Campbell says, Prisoner of the Cell Block H was pretty scary. Never watched it. Um, never watched it in the, in the 70s when it was out, the 70s and 80s. Echo, what's my opinion about Quigley Down Under? Why did it need an American protagonist? It would be my question. <clears throat> I think there's... A, a way to tell Australian stories with Australian characters and Australian actors. And it does it poorly. Ian Triffitt says, Twisted Tales. Yeah, Twisted Tales was okay, but I think that a lot of the endings were telegraphed in that series. Okay. <clears throat> There's a book about Sergio Leone. That would be interesting. Yeah, Prisoner, a horror anthology series, uh, Evil Touch, with Anthony Quayle doing the intro. There are some uh, episodes of that on YouTube, but they're in very poor quality. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, let's see, what else we got? <coughs> yeah, the original The Prisoner with Patrick McGowan, definitely uh, a really weird but wonderful series, that. Sally and I went to Port Merion, and she reckons she got food poisoning there, so don't start us on The Prisoner. Uh, this one, Matthew Sweet's The Lost World of British Cinema, Shepherd and Babylon, it's called. And it's about um, 1930s, 40s, 50s British cinema. And it's kind of a Hollywood Babylon look at British cinema. And uh, it's really an interesting little piece of history. And I like this one a lot because it tells stories and names names in a way that somebody with pretty an interest in cinema the way I have really um, enjoys. And I, I kind of like that. It's got a lot of stuff about Vivian Lee and, and Lawrence Olivier and other people like that. Dwayne says, saw Easy Rider and Driving years ago. I've got Easy Rider on 4K now. I haven't watched it on 4K yet, but I'm looking forward to that. Here we go. Middle-aged good girls off on a rant again. Yeah, the cars today Paris not a pass whiskey. When I was a kid, when I was a teenager, <clears throat> my local shopping centre had a display of some of the cars from the cars today Paris. So I actually got to touch that Volkswagen with all the spikes on it, a VW Bug. So the <laughs> for the Greek sweet book, yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually got to see the cars from that movie. I wasn't able to go and see the movie because it was R-rated here in Australia. But I, I did get to see the things. Justin, Sergio Leone, something to do with Death by Sir Frailing. Frailing did a good number of commentaries on the DVD and blues as well. Restored, complete version of Claude Rains' Battle of the Worlds is coming out soon on Blu-ray. Cool. Um, am I interested in reviewing it? Possibly, depending on how cheaply I can get it. Uh, if I have the book Hollywood Babylon with an overweight Lewis Taylor, yeah, I do. Uh, Babylon, I've got Hollywood Babylon 1, Hollywood Babylon 2, Kenneth Anger's books. Can I read them? Um, just give me a sec to scoot back. <coughs> Hopefully everything's not going to fall off the shelves. Do you mean these ones? There's Hollywood Babylon. There's the second one with Liz Taylor on it. Yes, I do have them. Everything is in the man cave. It's it's kind of like 
that warehouse where they stored the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it's a book called Rebels in the Backlot. About a, uh, it's about the wave of cool directors in the 1990s. Oh, okay, yeah, I've got a few. I've got, um, what, what have I got up there? There's, there's something that, along those lines. I've got Down and Journey Pictures, Peter Biskin's one up there. Uh, let's see. I'm getting off track. This one is Night Gallery uh, from the 1970s. Yeah, oh, Greg, I've got that. And there's a few good episodes. There's a really good one with um, Elsa Lanchester in it and Cameron Mitchell, which I really like. Uh, Night Gallery, I think, is an underrated one. People talk about The Twilight Zone when they're talking about Rod Serling, but I like Night Gallery and the way that it veered from comic to really nasty horror. Uh, I think it was, it's an underrated series. And it sits in my mind as a contemporary of things like The Night Stalker. I think that that range of 1970s American TV horror where censorship was all over them, but they still managed to tell the stories. It's quite interesting. This one you've got to find out. It's full of prurient stuff. Scotty Bowers, full service. Scotty Bowers was a guy who, after the war in Hollywood, basically procured sex workers for the rich and the famous in Hollywood. And it's... Um, a lot of fun to read. It tells you a lot of things about a lot of people. Edith Piaf, Spencer Tracy, Vivian Lee, Cary Grant, and King Edward VIII after his abdication. Catherine Hepburn, Rita Hayworth, Errol Flynn, Mae West, James Dean, Rock Hudson, and J. Edgar Hoover. Scotty Bowers, there was a documentary about Scotty Bowers. And this is one of the most salacious books about Hollywood you're ever going to watch. Every go to read, sorry. But it was a lot of fun for me to read that. Um, I keep watching, I've kept keep watching the skies, but there were 50 science fiction films. Reading about them is usually more interesting than watching them mostly. Yeah, but you still got to watch them. Uh, Roddy McDowell in the first night gallery is a legend around here. Roddy McDowell is a legend. I think he's becoming a legend to the channel too because he's turning up some very interesting things. Yeah, Night Gallery, yeah, he was Rod Serling. I mentioned that earlier. But, uh, yeah, I like the Night Gallery. Uh, Echo says, I just bought the book, The Untold Story by Michael Endy. Um, is he the guy that did that Never Ending Story? I think he may have been. But, uh, yeah, there's some really interesting movie books. Let's see if what else I've got. I actually brought this out before we started talking about Night Gallery and Twilight Zone, so. Interesting. I like revisiting this one. I want to revisit the series a little bit too. Ian, take care. Thank you very much for being a part of the live stream, mate, and for supporting the channel. I hope you guys are staying safe there. Uh, yeah, this one is uh, one that I'm going to revisit the series because I've got it on disc. I've got a lot of things on disc. But The Outer Limits Companion by um, David J. Show and Jeffrey Frenson. This one is a good one to have too. It's um, we've even got little notes sticking out of it. It's a slightly ratty asked copy of this, but I like the Outer Limits. The, I saw the Outer Limits um, one about the Bee Woman when I was a little kid. My uncles let me stay up, and I got really scared by it. Mostly, I think, by the music. But um, the Outer Limits has got a place in my heart because of that. Because my uncles Roy and John. Let me stay up late when I was staying at my grandparents' place where they lived. And um, I got to enjoy that. And their love of science fiction rubbed off on me. They took me to see this island earth. And that scared me as well. But, uh, yeah, Donna Pass, which you've asked a night film that Amazon made. It's a fun film made in the Twilight Zone Out of Limits episode style. Yeah, I think it did. But uh, I'm not sure whether it stuck the landing or not. For me, it, it didn't necessarily. The, land, the ending was obvious it was very visually interesting and, and the aesthetic and the direction worked really well for me but that ending was kind of underwhelming let's say but uh yeah i want to see more from that director i think it's a a good first movie and uh well i think they've got a long career ahead of them if they play it right do i have any other movie books i want to talk about no, that's about it. So any questions apart from anything else? 
Uh, Nightmare and FC Life and Art of Edward Jr. I think they based a film on it. Uh, yeah, Peter, I've got that one too, Nightmare and FC. It's not easily accessible, I don't think, because I've got some movie books put away. Let me see. It's Nightmare and FC on the shelves. Not that I can see. I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking for it. Uh, Noel Clooney says, Michael T Powell's two-volume autobiography and the biography of Emmerich Pressburg by his grandson. Kevin McDonald is in Lightning. Uh, I've actually got the Michael Powell, one of the volumes of the Michael Powell, easily accessible here. Might be a sec. Million Dollar Movie. There we go. I uh, haven't read it yet, but I really should. Yeah, Dwayne Carter says, cool uncles are awesome. I tried to be the cool uncle to my nephew. Took him to see Un the Uncharted movie, which I didn't enjoy, but he thought was the best movie ever. So uncles who take kids to cinemas are a treasure. My best friend had a Dark Shadows game back in the day. I love Dan Curtis, a great creative person in the series. Yeah, Dan Curtis did things like the um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Jack Palance in it. So, yeah, uh, I think that he... Needs a bit more love as well. He really is somebody that uh, should be more widely recognised in television history, in a sense. The, I, I will do. I will show you a movie that I should watch because the director is remaking it and reinterpreting it. It's a movie from, and I'll find out what year it's from, or maybe I won't. Peter Cushing says, the Tiff Hammer film books by Wayne Kinsey, really detailed books, cool. TV Rerun Club by NGM YouTube channel is putting out Adam Limits episode recently. Let's see how long they last till they get pulled down for copyright. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, yeah, Dan Curtis was the producer on Dark Shadows. But yeah, the cool uncle thing is, is always to be treasured. Uh, this one, I've got to watch. It stars Maggie Chung, I think. <coughs> Emma Vep. Now, I haven't watched this all the way through, but I really should, because the director, Oliver Ayes, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, Assays, uh, is remaking this one. Uh, this one is kind of based on Le Vampires, which is a silent movie serial made in the 1920s in France. And this is a reinterpretation of that with Maggie Chung playing an actress who's going to be playing Irma Vep, the original character from the a remake of these things, and it's very kind of meta. So I'm going to dive into that and enjoy it before the new version comes out. And I've had it sitting in the box for a while. It's from Arrow Academy, and, uh, yeah, I kind of like the aesthetic of that, and I'm going to enjoy it because I'm very much into those kind of French heroes like Fantomas and um, Judex and all of those kind of French pulp era uh, creepy uh, Avengers against bad guys. And as always, when I get towards the end of a two-hour session, my throat starts going because I don't normally talk for two hours straight. Anybody have any questions? Because I'm up for questions here. I'm very happy to answer them, though I have been answering them all through the um, live stream. So there is that. Let me see what else we've got. <laughs> Haven't organized this live stream as well as I thought I had. But, uh, yeah, uh, it's interesting. We're going to be getting some really interesting things from Umbrella soon. And I really want to talk about them. Uh, Grantman71 says, hope things are going well for you, Terry. Love the live chat and the Criterion stuff in Canada is starting to go on site. Yeah, getting Criterion stuff cheaply here is crazy problematic because it's not cheap. But there is so much good stuff coming out from Australian companies now. I don't feel we're missing out. And here come the sex bots again. Yep, and uh, I'm sure that middle-aged good girl is going to nail them. I'm going to have to be really nice to her after I finish the live stream because she is doing a lot of hard work here. Ray Lawrence's Bliss, Lantana, Jindabyne. I've seen Bliss and Lantana, and both of them I'm incredible fans of. Bliss I like a lot, and there are so many movies called Bliss. It's 
easy to lose it. <clears throat> but the one with Barry Otto in it, really great. It's, it's hard to interpret a certain Australian novels into cinema form, but I think that um, Ray Lawrence does an incredible job of it. Lantara is one of the great Australian movies from my book. And it's got things that happen that totally go against the grammar of what we know happens when certain things happen in movies. And uh, Anthony LaPaglia is really good in Lantana. Uh, Kerry Armstrong's really good in Lantana. I haven't seen Jindabyne, I really should. Uh, Lowell Clooney says, which little known directors do I most admire? That's a damn good question. Let me just think. Little known is a hard one. Uh, there are some Australian directors that I like. Uh, I think that, who, who would I put? Oh, I'm, you put me on the spot now. And I haven't had enough coffee for this. Uh, little known directors. I kind of like Stuart, uh, Charles Band's movies, those kind of 1980s era VHS movies I, I like a lot. They, um, they're dumb. They, they're done on relatively low budgets. They're all uh, aesthetically pleasing things. Uh, let's see. You got me on a spot there. I'm going to have to get back to Peel. Uh, let's have a look here. Little known directors that I like a lot. I like the guys who did uh, two Australian zombie movies called Wormwood and Wormwood Apocalypse. Wormwood Apocalypse has just come out. Uh, let's see, Wormwood. From, uh, that's from 2014. I'm just trying to remember. Uh, Kyle Roach Turner, uh, a really interesting genre director here in Australia who did Wormwood, also known as Wormwood uh, Road of the Dead, and the sequel, Wormwood Apocalypse. He's just got this crazy aesthetic kind of like um, a Mad Max meets a zombie movie. Uh, and I'm just going to have to get rid of some of these bots myself, I think. because they're filling up the chat. And middle-aged good girls on top of it now, so that's okay. But, uh, yeah, trances. I love trances. It's great. I like Zone Troopers. I'm waiting on a Blu-ray of Zone Troopers, which is like World War II American GIs in Europe meet aliens. Not a great movie, but it's got Tim Thomas in it. It's got uh, Art Lafleur. It, it really works for me, and it's one of those movies I loved since I saw it on VHS. So a lot of those Charles Band movies are just Lee Browning. Any thoughts on Mumblecore? None that I can do without getting demonetized on the channel. Um, I think that uh, Grantman seventy one says any movie marathons in the future? Yeah, I want to do one before the end of winter. Uh, I'm not sure what I want to do. I was kind of thinking of doing a movie marathon of my favourite movies, or else movies that I really hate. Now, I think that a 24-hour movie marathon of movies that I really hate may make me go to sleep. But I was thinking of doing all my favourite movies as a 24-hour movie marathon. I thought that might be an interesting way to go about it. So let me know what you think about that because that uh, that would be the way I'd take it. And thank you, middle-aged good girl. I love you. Thank you very much for getting rid of those bots. Oh, uh, yeah, it seems Zone Troopers in the early 90s and have it on my PC. Actually, pretty good, as I remember. Yeah, it is. Uh, Invasion of the Sex Bot sounds like a Jess Franco movie. Yeah, but it's not as much fun as a Jess Franco movie. Alternate Love and Hate says Darren Bennett. I could do that, but the problem is that uh, towards the end of a 24-hour marathon, my attention starts straying. And I think I'd rather do movies I like, and then maybe if I feel like it later on, I can do movies I hate. But uh, middle-aged good girl, I'm clicking as fast as I can to report the bots. Sorry. No, please, you're doing a fantastic job. How about Lee says, well, how about all the movies you fell asleep watching? No, that doesn't work because I finished watching them when I woke up. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that I'm going to have to get together a list of movies I like. And some of them are movies about Hollywood and movies about making movies as well. That might be fun and I can kind of break them down in – three or four, like, groups of two in different genres. So I was thinking about that. It's the exact same bot was persisting College World Series streams last week too. 
Uh, let's see, no one says I'm still working on my store DVD player and DVDs. Worth getting a Blu-ray player and getting Blu-rays? Ah, yeah, if you can afford it. But if you do get a region-free Blu-ray player, don't bother getting one that's region-locked. But if you do, you're going to be able to access a lot of stuff fairly cheaply because there are sales on. I know that uh, Zavi does sales of um, Arrow video movies and things like that at times. So for me, region-free Blu-ray player, definitely worth it. Go for it. Uh, Brian Lindsay says, watch Twins of Evils again last night. It looked more sumptuous and gothic Barber-like than the more famous Homer picks by Terrence Fisher. I think Barber was what they were going for. There was a kind of giallo feel to a lot of those later Hammer films that were a little more, let's say, titillating than the earlier ones. Uh, Anthony Diggle says, watching all the Police Academy movies in a marathon, maybe. Maybe not, though. I do have a... What I might do? Hang on. Let me think. I want to do a video in the future about the movies that Bobcat Goldthwait directed. Because as I can't, if you want to know little no um, directors I like, Bobcat Goldthwait's movies as a director are really interesting and really off the wall. He started with Shakes the Clown, which I love because it's set in a clown universe. But there are things like um, Father of the Year and things like that. A really interesting director and writer, and he makes some interesting choices that criticise contemporary issues in a, in a really interesting way. So to answer that question I got earlier, um, little known directors that I like, Bobcat Goldthwait's definitely there. Uh, Darren Bennett says, going 4K soon, recommendations for region-free Blu-ray with 4K. I don't know about region-free Blu-ray, but I know that 4K discs are region-free natively. So I'm really uh, enjoying that. I've got a region-free Blu-ray player for my Blu-rays that uh, are uh, region locked. And I've got the 4K player, which I watch the local Blu-rays on, and also the 4K ones. So, it's yeah, it gets to be a little mix and match. I think that region locking discs is, for me, problematic. I, I don't like it at all. But uh, that's the solution I've come up with. <clears throat> First three police academy movies are hilarious. Um, I might see if I can find them and, and do them at some stage. I may do just a video about them uh, and see how they hold up. But, uh, yeah, that that's starting to appeal to me, doing the police academy movies. But I'm not sure I'll do them in a 24-hour marathon. I might just do a, like a an overview of the, of the movies. Justin Kimmer says, most Philips Blu-ray players can be region unlocked with a code using the remote control. The one I've got, which is a lot cheaper than a Philips one, has a code that I put in to set it up for different regions on my Blu-ray player. And I'm fine with that. Uh, it's also good, having a region-free Blu-ray player is also good for me because when uh, someone like Umbrella or um, Impulse Indicator, sorry, Imprint, do uh, local release of DVDs and Blu-rays, I can test whether they're region free or not, because sometimes it'll say that a disc is region locked, but it actually isn't. And so um, having my region free Blu-ray play, being able to switch between regions, I can review the movie and then say, yes, this is region unlocked because I set it to American region and the disc still works. So for me, that's really useful. Uh, Mr. Gen Z, oh, I fell asleep watching Michael Fassbender's Hamlet twice, only because it was tired, though, and eventually watched it all. Uh, did Christopher Lee appear in a police academy movie? If and so, not the day of his career. Not sure if he did or not. It might be something to Google. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, re having region unlocked players is, is, opens the world to you. So if I want to get things like the Torosan movies, the Japanese comedy series that I really like on disc, I can do that and I don't have to worry about those restrictions. The only thing I need to worry about is whether they have subtitles in English. I made that mistake with something else. DK Moussos, he did the last one, last one Moscow. Yeah, so Christopher Lee was in a Police Academy movie, but I prefer me things like, the Return of Captain Invincible, where he gets to sing and dance. Uh, that was a lot of fun, Australian movie. 
Return of Captain Invincible with Alan Arkin in it. Uh, really a movie before its time in the way they handle superheroes. Commandant Rakoff was his role, says middle-aged kid girl who's been doing the Googleage. Thank you for that, Sol. Yeah. So uh, future 24-hour marathons, what could I theme around? I could do a 24-hour horror marathon. I think that would definitely be the way to go for a future one. Problem with doing 24-hour marathons is I have to work around Sal because she's got things she needs to do. And I don't get to do my chores if I'm sitting watching movies for 24 hours. So I've got to negotiate that and work around those domestic needs. And I do try to do that in a sensitive way, though we sometimes disagree about how I do it. But, um, yeah, I want to do more 24-hour marathons. In future. Echo, thank you very much. Take care and sleep well. And uh, thanks again for the support of the channel. I really appreciate that. And look after yourself. The camera says, Return of Captain Invisible is great. Richard O'Brien's songs are a big plus. Yeah, absolutely. Return of Captain Invisible, back in the day, was one of the go-to movies when I hung out with a bunch of people. We used to go to Canberra, the capital of Australia, and have two parties a year, one at midwinter, one at New Year's Eve, and the parties would last for a week. And we'd end up binge-watching movies, and Captain Invincible was one of those movies we watched. And uh, good times, a lot of fun. Police Academy movies ruined Steve Gutenberg's career as far as I'm concerned. I think Steve Gutenberg did that. But, uh, yeah, okay, take care, you, yep, mate. Bye. Try a horror movie marathon chronological or starting with movies set in the 1700s and the 1800s and 20th century. Or just to flip that a little bit, Brian, uh, what I might do is do um, horror movies that were made in certain decades, so like try to do something in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and onwards, I probably won't get to contemporary times because of time limitations, but there's a possibility there. And thank you for that tip. Really appreciate it. But, um, yeah, there's possibilities with the 24-hour marathon. The problem I've got at the moment is I've got to watch my blood sugars because I do have type 2 diabetes. So I'm going to balance my blood sugars by eating kind of healthy snack foods while I'm doing the marathon. and. Um, marathon not marathon marathon and i've got to kind of be aware of that because i did a failed 24 hour when i was first diagnosed because i kind of dipped into lows middle-aged kid girl says shark movies will you let me do a 24 hour movie marathon if i do shark movies because uh i know shark movies are one of your particular favorites why don't you do a 24 hour marathon of shark movies on your channel but uh let's see lee Bronx says horror movies made in the 1800s that sounds like a film plot waiting to be made. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can flip through the daguerreotypes and do that. Middle-aged geek girl says, yes, but only shark movies. No, I'm going to do other ones as well. And um, I will negotiate with you on that in a loving and respectful manner. Game of Treasure says, shark, no, oh, don't get her started on shark, no. She loves the shark, no, no movies. And she's got a whole bunch of collectibles from the shark, no, no movies. Yeah, don't pay some sharks for 24 hours. <laughs> That'd work well. You would really enjoy that. But yeah, um, the 24 hours do take a lot out of me. They're, they're a difficult one to do, but they're rewarding. It is fun to challenge myself like that. And it's interesting as you get towards the end of it, how um, the way you view the movie changes because you're tired. You've been bombarded with kind of input for 24 hours. It puts you in an interesting headspace. I, I think it's a good thing to do. I think it's a fun thing to do. And it does okay on the channels. On the channel, sorry. But uh, it puts you into a, a kind of spaced out headspace. So, yeah, uh, I'm kind of thinking I might do that, particularly now that it's winter time and the sun sets early. I haven't got anything to do outside anyway. Lee says, why isn't there an Australian shark NATO film? Because we eat shark here. Sharks don't eat us. You can go down to our local fish and chip shop and get flake, which is basically gummy shark. We eat sharks. The lady says, there was a recent one I saw on Chibi. I think it was called Bait. Might be wrong, but it was terribly good. 
Yeah, um, there are a number of them. Meg is on 4K. I, I noticed that when I was looking through the 4Ks, that the Meg, the movie with Statham, which was made with Chinese money and is one of those balls-to-the-wall crazy movies, uh, is out on 4K for no good reason. And here they come again. Suicide Squad had a shark, yeah. And there are those bots. Um, I'm going to have to tweak the settings, I think, to get rid of... Uh, don't start that middle-aged good girl. And she's onto them. Yeah. Uh, there's a setting I can experiment with on the stream, which makes even stricter uh, limitations on the live stream uh, chat. So I might have to do that for future streams because that is just getting bloody annoying. Okay, let's see what I got here. I can point out some things in the man cave. That there is an Ocean's Eleven poster on a, on a piece of steel. That's the record collection. That's a bunch of books I've got to put away. That's a Vincent Bryce pop vinyl. That's an Iron Man bobblehead. There are my two awards. That is actually um, the dome at the top of a Japanese television station. And that is a shrunken head uh, rum bottle. Brian says, with the translation to boutique economic model with physical media, do you think you'll finally get more of the neglected genres such as German crimi films and Italian pepper? Um, crimi films have come out. A good friend of mine has sent me a bunch of crimi films. Crimi only lasted for a short time. Uh, it has come out on Blu-ray already, and it's um, I, I, I got a lot of them given to me, which I really appreciated. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, look around, you'll find crimi movies already. Uh, Game of Treasure says, bomb movies, Austin Powers for added lesions. Uh, I do bomb movies except for the fact that I find the Roger Moore ones unwatchable. Peter Cushion says, future room tour. No, the place is a mess. You can see some of it down there, but this room is a total mess. I'd have to do a total revamp on it uh, to do a room tour. Grantman, 71, thanks for the chat. Have a good week. You too. And take care and thank you for watching the channel and supporting us. D. Cameron says, forget Chuck Nato, a great Australian genre movie is Razorback. Yeah, a friend of mine worked on Razorback, uh, my friend Lewis. He made the pig head for Razorback. And I went up to Silverton. We went up to Silverton where it was filmed. And the, at Sil the Silverton Hotel, they have like pictures on the wall from all of the movies that were made in the area, like Mad Max 2 and things like that. And there was a picture of my mate Lewis with his giant boar head. And I went to Lewis's house 25 years ago for a Halloween party. And this enormous boar head is on the wall of his house above the fireplace. It's made out of latex and, and foam and other stuff. But one of the boar heads from Razorback is actually in his house which is kind of cool. Uh, he's a special effects guy, really nice guy too. Uh, Krimi and Pepler are woefully underrepresented in the US. Absolutely. Uh, Pepler, I find I can handle some of them, but I can't handle others. I really should watch the Mario Bava Pepler because that would be kind of cool. Don't have pass with you. Yeah, it's so different from after short Connery films, hard to get into. Yeah, I think that Lazenby was a better Bond than uh, Roger Moore was. Uh, I think that Lazerby would have grown into the role if his manager hadn't told him not to do it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Eurospy movies, I did a video a few years ago about Eurospy movies, and it did really well on the channel. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, there are just so many niche genres that I want to cover in this channel. And I haven't been able to. I want to get more things like um, Southeast Asian superhero movies. There are a few out there, and there are more coming. Uh, they've had a lot of restrictions because of COVID uh, knocking their film industry totally in the ass. But there are things like that I want to cover on the channel in the future, and also more Indonesian genre films because they're next to Australia. They're up just off our top left-hand coast. So I want to do more of that kind of stuff. 
Uh, Noel says, sharks get treated unfairly in movies as monsters are largely people own. Mosquitoes are much more intrusive and harmful. When are they going to be the stars of a horror movie? I think there were giant mosquitoes in Food of the Gods in the 1970s. As I recall, attacking Ralph Mika. I think I, I watched that a while back. So I'm pretty sure there is. But um, that's one of the reasons zombie movies are so popular because the, the thing is most destructive of human beings is other human beings. And so that plays really well to a whole bunch of different political ideologies. So, yeah, really um, weird and wonderful stuff. But, uh, yeah, I, I've done mine. Oh, shit. And I've just ripped the mic off the thing when I bumped it. Let's get back on track, see? Losing my coordination after two hours. But, uh, yeah, Sharks, um, Mosquito, 1994. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate people adding to the conversation. Yeah, giant yeah, mosquitoes are, yeah, they're kind of icky, but I suppose they are. There was a giant bee in an episode of Time Tunnel. Yeah, Game of Thrones and Drop Bears. I think there should be a Drop Bear movie. I think there should be a number of Drop Bear movies. Yeah, Drop Bear 3, Perth Rampage or something like that. Some of the Italian uh, Eurocrime movies are done, but unfortunately are often riddled with extremely unpleasant misogyny. Yeah, they are. My favourite one's the Italian connection with uh, Mario Adolf, Henry Silva and Woody Strode in it, where Mario Adolf plays a pimp in Milan called Luca Canali. And uh, he gets blamed for something that's not his fault by the mafia, and they send a couple of American hitmen, played by Henry Silva and Woody Strode, out to get him. And Mario Adolf is basically a human tank in that movie. It's just such a lot of fun. Gavin Trojan says, Giant B in Doctor Who. There's been pretty much everything in Doctor Who. Um, I've kind of got fell in out of love with Doctor Who because it tends to be like, Magical Wizard Solves Everything, and uh, it's, um, I don't know whether I, I've grown out of it or grumped out of it, but uh, Doctor Who, I'm loving. They Live, yeah, They Live works well. Uh, I really should do that one, uh, John Carpenter's They Live, with their ants in it. But, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I should do a, a John Carpenter. There's a couple of John Carpenter movies that I've got on the way, and I might do a John Carpenter video which would be kind of cool because I like his work. I don't think he's always a successful director, but he's never not an interesting director. And uh, even things like Ghosts of Mars I like, which a lot of people hated, with a singular passion. But, yeah, John Carpenter um, I like a lot, uh, all the way back to uh, Escape from Precinct 13, which is his version of Rio Bravo which, again, is a movie I should cover as well. Rio Bravo is just such a fun Western, and it works really well. And also Gunfight at the OK Corral with Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster. Again, one of those kind of great mythic Westerns, which uh, work incredibly well in a modern context. And uh, Kirk Douglas playing Doc Holliday has some really fun scenes. Let's see, the old black and white monster movie, Them Had Giant Ants. Yeah, Them is great because it's basically a monster movie framed as a police procedural. You know, the cops are investigating mysterious things that are going on and they work it up from there. And I think that's a good approach to take to draw an audience into a particular kind of a giant monster movies. Middle-aged geek girl says, do you keep a list of movies you should review? Yeah, I'll show you which part of the man cave it's in. It's in between these two things. But, uh, yeah, them, 1954, great film. Some of the 1970s porn, Nashi horror films are great. Loads of atmosphere on minuscule budgets. I haven't got into Nashi, but I've been thinking I should. Yeah, uh, let's see. But uh, uh, thank you, middle-aged good girl. She's getting a bit antsy now. Wait, did, um, did I see Burglar Grand and Catherine Castle keep? Yeah, I did. I uh, did. Uh, I'm going to um, review that one in some stage in the future. Let me see if I can re-grab it without destroying my setup here. Yeah, Castle Keep, Bird Lancaster. I've just got it on Indicator Blu-ray. And I want to re-watch that. Uh, some friends have said I should re-watch it, and I knew I had to. But I'm going to re-watch that. Phase 4 is good, Scott. Absolutely. 
Oh, Saul Bass has such a beautiful visual aesthetic and an interesting way of storytelling. Uh, and yeah, Faithful has is striking in so many ways. Can you yeah. film quite a mess in the pit? Yeah, Empire of the Ants. Yeah, Empire of the Ants works well. Uh, Kingdom of the Spiders with Shatner is an interesting little film with a really great ending to it. Just so many good monsters. And it's not even giant spiders in this one. It's, it's still like tarantula-sized spiders. Not a past whiskey. The last couple of years have been really geeking out of Patrick Trout and Doctor Who. Maybe some of his, have, uh, most of the last episodes have been recovered or recreated with animation and original audio. Yeah. The uh, fan base for Doctor Who is really adding to what they have in a lot of ways. All the great. Thank you. Take care, mate. And um, uh, cockroaches were the Martians in the pit. <laughs> Game of Trojan. Not sure the cockroaches look a lot more like oversized grasshoppers. And yeah, there's an oversized grasshopper movie too, come to think of it. But uh, yeah, the Martians in the pit are interesting. Yeah, it was locust, yeah. And I like the way when they were disintegrating and they went all gooey and icky inside and everybody was grossed out by the pukey smell of them. That really added to the kind of verisimilitude and the groundedness of the hammer, quite a mess in the pit particularly, because, um, you know, people having a visceral reaction to disintegrating alien insects really kind of, it had something undefinable but really interesting to it. Uh, Paul Morrissey is one of my favourite interesting. I did the Paul Morrissey, um, Andy Warhol horror movies in a previous video. There's a John Wyndham novel about a hive spiders called Web, which has yet to be filmed, but is worth a read. Thank you. Night of the Lepus. Uh, slow motion giant rabbits are funny, D. Campbell. Based on a novel by an Australian, Russell Bratton, uh, Year of the Angry Rabbit, which was set in Australia because we've had rabbit plagues here since some arsehole um, released rabbits in the wild here in Australia so we'd have something to hunt because the native fauna was a bit too canny for it. And, uh, yeah, we've, we've had enormous problems with rabbits destroying ecosystems here. So Russell Braddon wrote the novel and uh, an American studio got the rights to it and totally changed it. But, uh, yeah, oh, so many 1970s movies I want to revisit. I want to do Gargoyles, that TV movie with Cornell Wilde and Bernie Casey in it. I should do that one as well because that one uh, has a lot of interesting things. So any last comments before I close down the live stream because we're heading up to the two-hour mark and my tummy's rumbling, which means that I probably need to get some food into it at some stage. But yeah, Night of Rabbits. Ah, Stuart Whitman in that one? I think he was. And Janet Lee. Stuart Whitman's a, an actor I really like. I'm doing a Stuart Whitman movie in the future, which I'm going to enjoy. 22 many US $5. Love to hear your guest of Mars takes some love to police or some ticks. Others think he phoned it in directing. You say yes and good fun. Thank you very much, 22 many. Is there a mouse plague in parts of Australia going on? There was uh, about eight months ago. But the, when things cooled down and when they got wetter, Mouse plague died back, but it's a recurring thing in particularly central New South Wales. If you know Evil Louis Jordan and a sequel, um, Scott, thank you for inviting us to see you. Thank you. No, that's okay. If you were here, you'd think it was a bloody mess, but uh, here come the bots to say goodbye. Ah, oh. Sands of the Kalahari. Already done Sands of the Kalahari, wait, on a previous video. But yeah, fantastic film, and Stuart Whitman just steals it. And middle-aged geek girl being a fox terrier attacking the rats that are attacking our live stream here. Excellent live stream, Terry. Many thanks from me and Ireland. Thank you, Noel. And uh, have enjoy your summer such as it is, mate. Island of Terror and the Mobile Rocks. Island of Terror I like. I think that it's got some messed up sexual politics. D. Camel, 10 quid. Great chat. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. I appreciate that too. No, I said you were a fox terror. I didn't say you were a dog. Uh, Waves from Island 2, Game of Trojan. Thank you. Thanks for going live. Enjoy this. My pleasure. And uh, you've still got 30 seconds. So thanks for everybody uh, being part of this. If you haven't already, definitely subscribe because it, it does help with the channel. You can also support the channel at patreon.com slash paleocinema. And I'm putting written movie reviews onto the Patreon site for people to enjoy. 
Thanks, Wade. And on that note, enjoy the rest of your day or get some sleep depending on where you are. And I'll do another live stream sooner rather than later. So take care and that's it. Bye.